How often do you think about the future? What do you feel? Are you hopeful? Optimistic? Or do you see no future for humanity on Earth? Humans have always imagined other worlds, whether good or bad, so-called utopias and dystopias. Referencing the work of the Frankfurt School on the utopian imagination, it is said that science fiction can form a kind of cultural indicator of a culture's ability or inability to imagine possible futures. These futures, however, do not need to be utopian. Famously, The Matrix represents a work of bleak dystopian science fiction, which involves highly developed neurotech, robotics, and artificial intelligence. The movie was inspired by the works of social theorist and philosopher Jean Baudrillard, especially his book titled Simulacra and Simulation, which even features in the movie. The main thesis of the book is that reality has been replaced with hyperreality. Hyperreality is said to consist of so-called simulacra, simulations of simulations of which the underlying reality no longer exists. One could say that our world increasingly consists of such simulacra and that our understanding of science fiction is successively transformed by the procession of said simulacra. Audria introduces three orders of simulacra. The first are natural simulacra. The second are so-called productive simulacra and the third are informational simulacra. Natural simulacra enable the first kind of science fiction, namely utopia, sketching futures enabled by technology which appear to liberate humanity from most, if not all, of its ailments. Secondly, productive simulacra enable prototypes for actual scientific innovation and research. In terms of the third kind, namely informational simulacra, Baudrillard issues an interesting statement. Quote, in fact, science fiction in this sense is no longer anywhere, and it is everywhere, in the circulation of models, here and now, in the very principle of the surrounding simulation." End quote. This third order is a zone that Baudrillard does not or cannot name. Quote, the most likely answer is that the good old imaginary of science fiction is dead, and that something else is in the process of emerging. End quote. The crisis that Baudrillard is isolating here is the gradual effacement of the distance that had traditionally enabled science fiction to function as a mode of envisioning the future. Without the distance between imagined future and historical present, between virtual realities and real virtualities, between information and the thing itself, science fiction begins to lose its own placement in our culture. Donna Haraway already mentioned in her Manifesto for Cyborgs that sex is already turning into genetic engineering and reproductive technologies, and mind into artificial intelligence and decision procedures. Perhaps science fiction can tell us something about the force that drives innovation and technological development. We interviewed various experts from fields that concern themselves with technologies that have often been included in utopian as well as dystopian narratives of science fiction. What they had to say contributed a lot to our understanding of the intersection of science and the imagination. Hopefully, it will do so for you as well. This journey begins at a small centre in the heart of Cambridge. Founded and visited by great names such as Stephen Hawking and Lord Martin Rees, the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk focuses on the potential dangers our world is faced with. This ranges across climate crises, natural disasters and, of course, technology. The focus on the looming threat of the misuses of artificial intelligence and the potential arrival of superintelligence have been addressed by many public figures. What's life going to be like if we are completely computerized and completely robotized? What are the side effects? Will there be difficulties? Undoubtedly. Will there be things that we won't like? Undoubtedly. But we've got to think about it now so as to be prepared for possible unpleasantness and try to guard against it before it's too late. We always have to do that. It's like in the old days when the automobile was invented. It would have been so much better if we had built our cities with the automobile in mind instead of building cities for a pre-automobile age and finding we can hardly find any place to put the automobiles or to allow them to drive. This is the sort of thing that we must avoid in the future. The Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence represents a sister center to the Center for the Study of Existential Risk and focuses primarily on AI. Part of their work is to investigate potential futures, warn of them, or advocate for them. We have spoken to John Burden and Kant Adihal to discuss the impact science fiction narratives have had on their work and what narratives drive their own research. 
science fiction can be like a great vehicle for exploring sort of speculative ideas and sort of trying to play out there uh, the consequences of certain ideas or certain advances in technology and, and see where they lead to without necessarily putting things at risk. Um, it's obviously not perfect, but it allows us for sure to see um, which, which idea would be important to not pursue or the benefits of pursuing certain ideas. In which way does science fiction shape the way you think about the future of technology, the future of AI? Right, so one of the things I look at in my research is that question of how does science fiction shape the future of technology and AI and I have found many ways in which there is a direct link between science fiction and technology. Um, a link that goes two ways, of course new technologies and new developments influence um, what uh, kinds of science fiction are being uh, created but also there are a few very dominant science fiction narratives that have been extremely influential mm -hmm. in shaping the direction of technological development, mm -hmm. of research funding and of uh, public imagination, so what people want out of the technology. In which way are the kind of future perspectives and risks and let's say ethical questions, uh, in which way are they inspired by these narratives and what kind of narratives would they be? So um, narratives that contain some form of super intelligence have been particularly influential. Right. That uh, ranges from um, the more dystopian ones, 2001 a Space Odyssey, right. um, The Terminator, uh, to uh, more positive ones, um, AI Odyssey. Artificial intelligence uh, was a film that really brought the term artificial intelligence into the public understanding. The robot stories from uh, Isaac Asimov from the 1950s, um, as well as uh, the later uh, film I Robot, which has very little to do with the book I Robot, but together, actually, okay. yeah, yeah. the film I Robot has. Uh, a menacing superintelligence in it, whereas I, Robot, the book, is all about um, these uh, intelligent robots working together with humans and right. obeying humans. What you can really see is that, uh, especially the influential films, um, contain superintelligence and it usually goes badly. Uh, this has really uh, created an idea of artificial intelligence equals superintelligence equals threat. Right. It's often an idea of um, oh, humans haven't really thought this through and that's why it goes wrong when you get this machine that can do things really well. Mm -hmm. Transcendence is also um, a, an example of what I've in my research called the Californian feedback loop mm -hmm. where the development of the film and the development of technology uh, both happen in California at the same time and are really closely intertwined. Oh, right. So, for example, there's a cameo of Elon Musk in Transcendence. True, I remember, yeah. Um, and Morgan Freeman, who plays a computer scientist in Transcendence, um, then became a board member of the Future of Life Institute, um, which you know re uh, researches superintelligence risks and opportunities. Uh, so um, these connections, they are constantly being reinforced between some kinds of fiction and the technology coming out of the same area. Can you prove yourself aware? That's a difficult question, Dr. Tag. Can you prove that you are? Would you say that utopias or dystopias are more powerful in conveying some sort of message? Because I get, get the feeling you achieve more if you play with people's fears. So that, that could explain maybe why there's so many dystopian AI visions. Or do you think utopias can be just as powerful? Utopias can be powerful, but it's just much harder to get them right in a narrative form that um, is, is interesting and compelling. Mm -hmm. And that isn't in some way in itself still a dystopia. Right, it's, one that's sold as a utopia, but in reality, if you have to live in it, you may not actually like it. Yes, exactly. Ursula K. Le Guin did this really well in her novel, The Dispossessed, mm -hmm. where she presents a um, a moon inhabited uh, by a people following a very uh, communist ideology mm -hmm. and a planet inhabited by people following a very capitalist ideology mm -hmm. and they each present the other 
as the dystopia right. and themselves as the utopia. Right, right. And of course, if you read the novel and see both, then you see, oh, neither of them are the utopia. Right. That's like a sci-fi version of the Cold War in a way. Right? Yes, exactly, exactly. And um, most utopias really are in some way some people's dystopias. Right. Um, if you look at Thomas More's original novel Utopia, the 17th century novel in which the which coined the term uh, mm -hmm. Utopia, mm -hmm. it was presented as an ideal society. It had slavery. All right. So utopias have never been um, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have never seen a, a representation where I thought, well, that right. is genuinely utopian. But there is a lot more work coming out right now in science fiction that tries to explore well what is possible around narratives involving AI that isn't outright dystopian, or in which it's the like majority of people are happy, which is an improvement on today's society. You, you know, the, the extreme, everybody is happy, super utopia, mm -hmm. um, and there is the dystopia, and there's our society, there is a lot to be improved. And so you have um, works by well, Ian M. Banks in the 20th century, um, Isaac Asimov, mm. um, but nowadays um, people like um, Ada Palmer, Becky Chambers, um, exploring, well, how can we at least get closer to some utopian ideal? And that involves AI and, and has got some very interesting new angles on um, science fiction. It was fascinating to hear about all these narratives about the future, conjured up by brilliant minds, but what we wanted to know was, what were the narratives that inspired the people at the center to work for a better future? So the, the future vision that drives my work is basically um, shaped by um, turning against the dystopias that are being presented in fiction. I mean, what I do is um, looking at these dystopias, these imperfect utopias, and seeing, well, why are they a threat and how might they come to be? And how do we make sure that they don't come into being? And so in that sense, both the dystopias and the utopias have this very valuable warning uh, function of um, showing us what might go wrong. And some of them indeed show us what might go well. Mm -hmm. And there's much fewer of those. And sometimes you really have to look among the threats and the scary bits to find the bits where you think, oh, this is a good way forward. We uh, discuss a lot of ideas. One, one thing that I found particularly interesting was trying to explore what it means to be sort of an AI, particularly when this mind, or this, this, this AGI, this mind is sort of physically spread across, across the globe and perhaps further, and it's, the communication between various parts is going to be quite you know, limited by, by just the laws of the universe, the laws of physics. Um, and how does this affect its ability for things like cognition? Or how, how does this affect the way that we as humans interact with it? And this, this, there's some parallels here with some uh, very some of my favorite sci-fi um, novels, such as um, *Blind Side* by Peter Watts, mm -hmm. um, fits in with that about the idea of consciousness not necessarily being evolutionary sort of um, optimal, and, and sort of how how different brain structures might lead to different types of cognition. And I think that was very interesting um, to explore in the in the Alpino entry. There is kind of uh, this this attempt at Caesar as well to look at dystopian futures as well. I've seen a future a, a world building um, project that was um, showing slaughter bots. Well, that was actually FLI, I think, as well. That was the same. All right. That was the same group. So FLI as well. We do a lot of. Um, I think they fund a lot of the stuff we do here as well, but more that you know, funding people everywhere. And they had they made a short film about these small, um, not quite nano-sized bots, but these small drones that could go around and like automatically take out political opponents or assassinate people or something. Right. Um, and that's the sort of thing that that season we also like to explore and try and figure out what types of technologies need to be prevented or you know 
we often like to talk about technology as sort of a sort of a society. We like to talk about technology as sort of like a, a double-edged blade in a way, right? Like mm. it's not you know we like to say it's sort of neutral. It's not good or bad, but some technologies for sure have more like bad tech, you know applications than good. And when we're talking about like very possibly very intelligent systems or sort of automated systems wielded by people who have a lot of power. We're definitely then in the scenario where some technology definitely has more bad applications than, than, than good, and maybe we should think about whether we actually want to go down the route of developing it. Everybody was dancing, and, and then suddenly we heard horrible. The George Orwell book called 1984, which he wrote, I guess, in 1948. And that's where the, the um, sort of idea of Big Brother comes out. And it's some sort of world where people are constantly being watched, are not really free to speak their mind. There's little notion of sort of free will or free time. Everything is done for, for the state or for the collective. The further we got investigating the relationship between science fiction and actual science, the more it became clear that the current scientific and technological development was intertwined with the narratives espoused in science fiction. Humans need a drive and motivation to pursue the development of a technological advancement, and this is often provided for by science fiction. In the same way, it may just reveal an uncomfortable truth about the trajectory of current research and development which we all need to be aware of. It does make you think about, are we being watched? Do we really do what we want to do? Are we sort of very manipulated by a very, very clever system? I, I guess the, the way to avoid this is to really think scientifically about things and, and be able to probe and not believe things, right? Ruben Portugues is a lecturer at the Technical University of Munich, where he gives lectures tailored for the Elite Masters program of neuroengineering. Neuroengineering represents a new emerging field of research, bridging the gap between human and machine. The development of brain-computer interfaces is projected to facilitate the rehabilitation of millions of affected patients with disabilities. In science fiction, the merger of human and machine has been most represented by the cyborg, the human hybrid of the future. We're already a cyborg. Um, it's just that I mean, you have a digital version of yourself or, or partial version of yourself online in the form of your emails and your social media and all the things that you do. And you have basically superpowers in, in that with your computer and your phone and, and the applications that are there. Um, you have more power than the President of the United States had 20 years ago. So you can answer any question, uh, you can video conference with anyone um, right. anywhere, you can send a message to millions of people instantly, you know, you just do incredible things. Gordon Cheng, who is a professor for cognitive systems and the founder of the neuroengineering program in Munich, gave us an insight into his views on science fiction and its impact on technological development. And in modern time, you know, you have all your um, Avenger metrics uh, and Avatar and uh, Surrogate. These all play a, a role in the way that it projects uh, a future, possible future. And also at the same time, a future that we need to take care of. Mm -hmm. uh, it brings awareness and also bring uh, uh, inspiration. But the awareness uh, it also is it's a, it's a key part. Uh, people should be aware of what they're doing. And when you're dealing with uh, the brain, it's kind of sensitive. Right? And also dealing with uh, a dangerous technology, or you know, there is a dual use issue that need to be uh, communicated. It, it's a conversation we have to have. To have. A lot of sci-fi is for entertainment. Like people have to take, make their judgment on that, but also conjure up some conversation that we have to have. Should not always present the negative. Mm -hmm. right? There is a lot of positive to it. Right? Understanding the brain, bringing technology to understand the brain, and to actually utilize those technology to help others, right? it should not be forgotten. Do you, in that case, believe that human behavior is, is kind of predictable? I think my intuitive answer to this is no. 
I would like to believe that we have agency about what we do. We should be held accountable and responsible for what we do somehow. My answer in broadest terms is, I don't think it's fully predictable. I, I do think that we have choices and whatever free will, even though we study the brain. I think, I think understanding choice and is, is uh, difficult, but I think it is there. To track suspects and the people they associate with, and even to predict crime. Perhaps Baudrillard was right. Perhaps we are entering an age in which the line between science and fiction is becoming increasingly blurred. Many current developments are happening at such an accelerated pace that many of us seem to lose the grasp on what is already possible. One notable example is the scandal that occurred with Cambridge Analytica, a small company that went as far as manipulating the 2016 election in the United States, merely using the data they had collected from millions of Facebook users. The age of big data and social media appears to enable a much deeper insight into the personalities of people which in turn enables a much more targeted approach at advertising and manipulation of the input of information. A major warning about the dangers of such technologies was issued by one of the PhD students of the Psychometric Center at the University of Cambridge. John Rust is the founder of the Psychometric Center and oversaw the research that led to an algorithm that was able to predict your personality very accurately, solely based on a handful of Facebook likes. John explained to us how his PhD students, Michal Kuzinski and and David Stilwell were able to develop this impactful technology. He explained to us how David was able to obtain the necessary data for the big data revolution in psychometrics. He didn't just get the people to complete the questionnaires, he also got their colleagues to complete the questionnaires as if how they thought they would fill it in. So he had data on 360 degree feedback as well. Um, it was just an enormous data resource that he made available to other academics with the consent of course of the participants who agreed it could be used for academic purposes. Uh, so there are over a hundred people have used this data set. At the same time uh, another PhD student um, joined the centre, so a psychologist but he had a background in coding, and it was about the same time shortly after that Facebook introduced Facebook likes. His particular insight was to realise that a Facebook like could be treated like a personality test item, that is, do you like Lady Gaga? Click, or do you not like Lady Gaga? Don't bother to click. Or And this data was made available by Facebook. So there was data not only on people's personality, but on the millions and millions of things which they could potentially like. Now, of course, of these millions of things, some of them are quite rare, like I love walk walking on crunchy leaves, I remember being one of them. Other ones, which should have been like well-known politicians, were quite common. Even with fairly um, unusual ones, I'm not quite sure if the crunchy leaves one quite met this criteria, where you were matching them with six million personality profiles, there would still be several hundred people who would have clicked on both right. the personality questionnaire, giving that extroversion, neuroticism, um, openness, etc. scores, as well as the thing. Uh, this effectively meant that you could cross-correlate the personality database with those likes which are sufficiently common to overlap with a large enough number. And in doing so, you would be able to find out what personality profiles went with which particular collection of likes. Now, of course, the big inset here was that if you could predict personality from someone's Facebook likes, and it proved to be pretty accurate if you had more than 600 likes, it was quite good, then you didn't actually need to give a personality test to someone in order to know their personality. Right. This information was already there. The people who'd like things are already providing it free of charge, not just to Facebook, but anyone Facebook allowed them to have it. This meant if you're an advertiser, um, you were able to identify someone's personality and target your toothpaste advert not just at people who happen to have a particular gender or age, but also people who like particular flavors, people who had particular characteristics, people who bought, bought toothpaste for particular reasons, often personality related. So it was the beginning of an enormous revolution in online digital advertising. 
which also led, among others, to the famous Cambridge Analytica scandal. Indeed. Uh, Mahal and David wrote a paper in 2013, because um, they realized what was going on, warning people that um, it was possible to make these predictions, not just of someone's personality, but also of all sorts of other characteristics as well, such as sexual orientation, um, age, gender, political views, and so on. This was very much written as a warning piece. It said, hang on world, do you realize this, this thing has now suddenly emerged? Of course, academics tend to assume everyone's interested in academia, uh, in getting their Nobel Prizes and not in money. Um, the facts that they were warning people not to do it, of course, woke up all the people who should not have been warned not to do it, who then went on and did it. Your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. Um, controlling experience is how you would do it. If, if you think of what's happening now in terms of um, censorship, for example, of the internet in countries who can see how easy this is, as soon as you manipulate the internet, uh, you manipulate the media. Um, as Marshall McLuhan said, the media is the message. If you control television, uh, then you are controlling what people have access to, then you can control their thought processes. They will always get rebels, of course. There are people who will always think the opposite. But if you make a system like that controlled by AI, it can also predict the characteristics of those people who would think the opposite. And as we know, it can micro-target messages to them in order to change their minds in a different way to other ways. So the potential damage from this is, um, Hal and David's discovery, if you like, is it's, it's world-changing. Is the transparency and predictability of life inevitably a bad thing? Are we moving towards dystopia or perhaps already living in it? Many perspectives on artificial intelligence leave out the views of the second biggest contributor to the field, namely the People's Republic of China. Wai Dong Sun, a professor for AI from Tsinghua University, took the time to explain to us how the wider data availability in China enabled a more efficient application of AI in the medical field. Lawadio 然后样本数据比较多我可以给你散这个例子有经验的这个医生相应的工作在一个国际会议
，是我们做的，在比较大的能够拿到的这个数据集上，比较大的数据集上能够实现的这样一种东西。你在国外呢，很很很多情况下哈、啊，医学图下，手头就拿不到那么多，所以说这个整个的工作没法开展下去。那这就是我们我感觉到哈、啊，是我们呃国内的一些 AI 技术为什么发展的比较快，为什么做的。走的走的路子呢也比较快的一个主要的原因，从这个对于对于技术安全来讲啊，它不存在东西方的差异。那我认为就是说，只要是人开发的技术，它都是可控的，可控就意味着它是无害的。What impact we made so far is only scratching the surface. There's still a lot more we need to do. That's why. Sci-fi or neuroengineering? No, neuroengineering. We're only scratching the surface. We can help a, a few people. Yeah. Right, and you know, my ambition is maybe 20 million people. See if I can do that before I retire. Okay. Right, you know, neuro neurological disease. I mean, we're talking about billions of people affecting. Right, so if we can actually help a larger, larger faction, not just a few selected one, that would be the best thing we can do mm -hmm. with new engineering. And this is why we need uh, such program. Yeah. For me, that's, this is why it's needed. We need to ed educate the next generation, right, with the same uh, passion, to actually see if we can bring out the technology, right, that better match the brain, the body, right, and the technology that go along with it to help them. So, what do you think? How long will it take for neuroengineering to influence everyday life? It's starting to already. You can see a lot of this rapid, rapidly changing, mm -hmm. right, and many people are being very much aware of it, many universities being aware of it, right? and they're starting new program uh, similar to ours, right? to actually gener creating a new generation of people mm -hmm. to actually get these technology out. Right? And there's so many, I mean, just exoskeleton alone, there's so many out there now. It's great. When I was doing it, there's nothing out there. Yeah. Right? So it's great. Now we actually highlighted the kind of technology that is needed to help people, right? I think that there's still more work to do. So if we now do like a little imaginary time travel in let's say plus 50, 100 years, how, how do you imagine uh, the influence of neuroengineering actually being on everyone? Okay. I think it'd be completely transparent. You would not notice that somebody disabled or not. Oh, okay. okay. Well, my vision is that you would not notice uh, if I'm wearing exoskeleton, you would not notice. Oh, you, you mean it would be that slim, nobody would know? Nobody would notice. Okay. Uh, you live a, live a normal life. Even if after your injury, uh, you're supposed to be paralyzed, it will just completely transparent. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. I think that's going to be a debate that we have to have. And it will be a very much a personal choice. Do I want somebody, you know, tapping into my brain? The level of privacy uh, that also need to be discussed. The awareness of such uh, ability need to be uh, brought up in public. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a public discussion. Even the simple thing like a camera on our phone have that same uh, eeriness right, that people have. Right? You're trespassing on my privacy, you're taking my photos. Right? Those things right, need to be done. And now we're talking about brain to brain. That's another level. Whether you believe that technology will be the cause of our demise as a species, or whether it will liberate us, it is undeniable that stories and narratives structure our beliefs about what is to come and what could possibly come to pass. Every age and every development carries the potential for great good and great evil. In many ways, the ancient psychological archetypes that can be found throughout our stories even show themselves in cyberspace, and perhaps ever more clearly. Uh, there are many ideas that exist among humans which sort of keep coming up across cultures in all sorts of different ways that Jung was important in identifying the idea, for example, of the animus and the anima, the male and female persona, which he, ar he argued was fairly universal. Um, archetypes like war and the, the god of war, Mars, for example, represents um, a, a particular way of looking at things. 
Um, Freud's id, for example, the primal forces often associated, with, if you like, in religion with original sin and evil, a sort of shared characteristics of, of the human species. And I think it's quite interesting to note that in the digital world, when you go online, it's almost as if these shared characteristics have also gone online as well. Right. So we've all there as our individuals and all the bots there, but don't you also get the sense that the id is there as well? You know, right. the fact that we're all being horrible to each other on Twitter. Right. It's almost as if some part of humanity is transferred into cyberspace as well. And the uh, AIs, increasingly the most popular AIs, can always be seen as some sort of representing some sort of archetype, right? You get a lot of. Uh, female voices that are yeah. that try to that, that have this sort of nurturing soothing air to yes them, right? oh, my dear friend alexa right. will we let our unconscious drives for power and domination drive the course of technological development or is there something in us that allows us to bring forward our benign element so that our descendants can live in a world that is as far removed as possible from what we would call a dystopia but the fact that we're not all psychopaths suggests that is not the above way to behave. We know that if we're going to live in society, we have to have a set of values where we get expectations from each other about standards of morality, which are acceptable and which will not enable society to thrive and to improve. And so, this is my optimistic thought, if we can do it, so can the AIs.